Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tony DeBell, and welcome to this Global ACS video. I'm joined today by Sandra Thompson and Gary Berkowitz. Our plan for the next 45 minutes or so is to continue our discussions of the issue that is most relevant to our stakeholders at the moment. And that's the accounting implications of the uncertainty created by the coronavirus, and in particular, the uncertainty created by the measures taken to control the spread of the virus and to support businesses and economies. In our previous discussion in April, we focused on the areas of accounting most affected by uncertainty, specifically the impairment of financial and non-financial assets, accounting for some of the support provided by governments, the implications for the assessment of going concern and interim reporting. Today, I'm going to ask Sandra and Gary to talk about the accounting for lease concessions, the depreciation of assets, and some issues around measuring fair value for financial assets. We'll start by talking about something that's proved to be almost as widespread of an issue as impairment, and that's lease concessions. Social distancing and lockdown have made it difficult for some lessees to properly or to fully use leased assets. For example, shops and leisure facilities are all closed. This has led in many cases to lessors granting concessions to the lessees, sometimes as a result of government intervention and sometimes as a result of negotiation. The question is how to account for those concessions. I'm going to ask Sandra to talk about this. Uh, and to begin with, what sort of things have you seen? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, we are seeing different forms of concessions. So they're commonly granted to lessees that can't use a leased asset, for example, because of retail stores closed due to lockdown. And the concession could take the form of a rent forgiveness. So maybe no rent payments are made at all for the months when the store's closed. It could alternatively be a rent deferral. So the rents are not forgiven, they're simply delayed until the store reopens. And then in some cases, we've seen some upfront cash rebates. They're less common. They could be rebates of rents that have already been paid or maybe returns of security deposits. But I say those are less common. And as you said, Tony, there are different reasons behind rent concessions. So some of them actually come out of terms that are already in the lease contract. Some of them result from government actions. Government may mandate a rent forgiveness or a rent deferral. And some of them are, are neither of those. So if you like, the, the lessor voluntarily grants them the rent concession. And we're seeing all of those. It is a complex area and we have limited time. So today I'm only going to focus on accounting for the concessions themselves. I'm not going to focus on things like property tax relief for lessors or indeed if the government compensates the lessor in some kind of way. That might be a government grant, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. OK. So, so what are the accounting consequences? Do these types of arrangements modify the lease? Um, that's a good question. Um, IFRS 16 defines a lease modification to include a change to the consideration for a lease. Now, if some of the rentals have been forgiven or delayed, you might think that's a change in consideration. So therefore, that's a lease modification. But actually, that's not necessarily the case. And it will depend on facts and circumstances. And in many cases, a degree of judgment will be needed. There is no one size fits all answer to that question. Um, and in addition, in April, the ISB very helpfully put out a two page document to give some educational guidance in this area. And that said, a rent concession could be any of variable lease payments. It could be a rent forgiveness. Um, it could be a rent deferral or it could be a lease modification. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to talk through some examples of all of those and when they might apply. Um, but I do want to emphasise up front that ultimately it could be a matter of judgment and there is no one size fits all answer. The other thing I'll say is we do have an FAQ that goes through in a bit more detail what I'm about to talk to. Um, so you don't need to frantically scribble for the next five or ten minutes because you can go and look at the FAQ where it's all there. So the first case I'll talk about is where there is something in the lease contract itself. For example, there might be a force majeure clause and it might be clear that that clause applies to COVID-19 and indeed what the consequences are. So you might have a case that says the force majeure clause kicks in in these defined scenarios. And one of those is a global pandemic as declared by the World Health Organization. And then the clause might go on to say, if a result of the force majeure a leased property is closed, for example, a retail store um, can't open, 
then for that period of time, rents are either forgiven or deferred. Now it's clear here, that's not a lease modification. It all comes out of the contract itself. Um, so in that case, you might well account for that as variable lease payments. That's both lessee and lessor. Actually, they are negative variable lease payments. Normally, variable lease payments increase the rents due. In this case, they decrease the rents due, but the accounting's the same. So both the lessee and the lessor in operating lease would book the impact in the period in which the, the concession is granted, in the period in which it occurs, and the lessee would book a, a corresponding gain to the income statement to the extent there is one. Now, not all force majeure clauses are unfortunately that clear. In some cases, it might not be clear if they apply to COVID-19 at all, or in other cases, they might apply, but it's not clear what consequences are. For example, it might be a, a right to renegotiate or to have a discussion rather than it's clear that payments are, are deferred or reduced. In those kinds of cases, the parties might need some legal advice to interpret the clause, or there might be a degree of judgment. But if you reach the conclusion that it does stem from the contract, then it can still be negative variable lease payments. That's my first case. The second case is where the rent concession results from an action of government. Now here you need to bear in mind that IFRS 16 says for lease accounting, the parties clearly look at the terms and conditions of the lease, but they also look to other relevant facts and circumstances. And the IB document helpfully clarified that that includes any applicable laws or regulations. So for example, if a government mandates that lessors give rent concessions to specified groups of lessees for specified periods, then that might be seen as to be accounted for in the same way as if that was actually in the contract itself because it stems from an applicable law or regulation and just like I just talked through that might be accounted for as a, a negative variable lease payment exactly the same as the first case. So those are probably the two simplest cases it now gets a bit more complicated. Um, the third case, case is where there is a degree of rent forgiveness so there's nothing in the contract it doesn't stem from a direct government action but the lessor voluntarily forgives some of the rents that would otherwise be due. Now here you need to bear in mind that when it comes to lease accounting, IFRS 9's derecognition requirements apply to both the lessee and the lessor. Um, and they say that if a, a, um, an amount that would otherwise be contractually due is forgiven, then that's a partial extinguishment of the relevant asset or liability. So if we start with the lessee, they might say, well, there's a degree of rent forgiveness. Um, that's a partial extinguishment of some of the lease liability that was previously due. And therefore, they might derecognize the present value of the payments that have been forgiven and book a corresponding gain. We flip over to the lessor in a finance lease where they have a lease receivable on the balance sheet. They might simply say, well, some of that lease receivable is now extinguished, derecognize the present value of the rents that were otherwise due and book a loss. That's my third case. The fourth case is where rents are not forgiven, they're simply deferred. So there's no reduction in the total amount due, it's just rescheduled. For example, a lessor might agree that if a store is closed in say, April, May and June, that the rents would otherwise be due as simply paid in July, August and September. There's kind of catch up payments over those later three months. Um, or they might be deferred for longer periods, they might be added on the back end of the lease. Now for these, the ISV document says that if the rent deferral is judged to be proportionate, we'll come back to that, then you might judge there's not actually a change to the lease consideration. Um, the lease consideration overall is the same, it's just been deferred slightly, and therefore that's not a lease modification. Now the obvious question is what is a proportionate deferral as opposed to a non-proportionate deferral? And that too will be a judgment. There's no bright lines like much as of IFRS. So for example, a very short short-term deferral, like the one I just described, might be just be proportionate, or if additional interest is charged for the period of the deferral, that might be judged to be proportionate. If there's a much longer-term deferral, say for 10 years, then that might not be proportionate, but it's going to be an error of judgment. For a deferral that is proportionate, so therefore does not to be a modification, um, then that doesn't mean that the lessee does nothing. There will be a small present value impact because the rents have been deferred, certainly if there isn't additional interest at the same rate that's in the lease. Um, so therefore you have to do something for that present value effect 
Um, and one thing the lessee might do is just to book that impact immediately. So get a small gain just for the present value difference that results from the deferral. Um, and similarly, a lessor in a finance lease might do something very similar. I should also say that lessors should think about the impairment requirements in IFRS 9 because those also apply. And then finally, my final case, case five, is anything else. So other kinds of concessions. And two examples here might be the non-proportionate deferral that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, or indeed when you've got a more complicated package of changes. So it's not just deferring or forgiving some of the rents. Maybe there's also a change to the scope of the lease. I think you might say, well, those are actually to be accounted for as lease modifications under IFRS 16. And then you do the normal lease modification accounting. So if we start with the lessee, they effectively account for this as a new lease. So they take the revised lease payments, either deferred or modified as they are, they will discount those at a revised effect, effective discount rate. So they reset the discount rate. Um, that might result in a number that was bigger or smaller than the lease liability they had before the modification, um, but any difference will be added or deducted to the right of use asset. As I said, that might give you a, a positive number, a negative number. It might be big, it might be small. You're just going to have to work it out case by case, depending on how the discount rates moved and how the lease payments have changed. Um, if in some cases the effect on the discount rate might be small, for example, if under IFRS 16, when the lessee first adopted IFRS 16, they use what we call modified retrospective and set their discount rate in 2019, not long ago, but it might not always be. So you're just going to have to work out the numbers, facts and circumstances. Um, and then for the lessor in an operating lease, they do very much the same thing. They count for it as if it were a new lease um, and they therefore would take the revised lease payments and generally spread them often straight line over the remaining lease term and for finance leases um, a lessor there would do IFS 9 accounting which is to take revised lease payments and discount them at the, the old discount rate and book a corresponding gain or loss. So those are my five cases you can see it's not easy I do recommend the FAQ which gives a bit more detail and hopefully will help you find your way through. So that all sounds like it could be just a little bit complicated um, for moving from the, the theory of the standard to something a little more practical, what should lessees and lessors actually be thinking of uh, when they begin to think about these issues? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and three things I want to flag. The first, as you said, Tony, this could actually be quite complicated. So there could be some operational challenges. So lessees and lessors might have many different leases in different countries, different terms and conditions, written at different times, perhaps they've grown through acquisition. They are going to have to get hold of their contracts, work out what clauses are in there, look at what government actions there are, look at the type of lease concession. Um, and that might take some time to work through, particularly when staff are working at home, or perhaps you've got some staff off sick or with caring responsibilities. So I think my first message is don't underestimate the size of the task um, and get on with it if you need to. The second practical consideration is just think about the accounting outcome. So if the parties conclude it's not a modification, then in some cases the accounting impact might be very similar, whichever of the other options it is. Particularly a number of these rent concessions are being given month by month as we see how the pandemic plays out. So the difference between, say, a a rent forgiveness and a variable lease payments may actually be not materially different. So you may be able to group leases into the types of concessions, whether it's clear it's not a modification, and therefore conclude, all right, I'm not quite sure if it's A or C, but actually there's not a material difference. And that could be a very um, practical way to address the challenges. And then my third point is about disclosure. You can see there is clearly room for judgment here. Um, the accounting impacts can be different. So it's very important that lessees and lessors disclose both the judgments they've made and what the accounting impact has been. Uh, okay, now, now IFRS 16 is obviously a shiny new standard, but I guess no one could have imagined addressing the sorts of issues that have been raised by the pandemic. I know you mentioned the IASB when you were speaking earlier, so, so what's the board been up to? Yes, a shiny new standard. Mine's quite well thumbed, actually. Um, 
Yeah, the ISB is very aware of this issue and they have been very ready to act quickly. So two things they've done. The first is the two page document I mentioned and I've just walked through. But the second is they have actually proposed an amendment to IFRS 16, which would apply to lessees. And this would kind of address the operational challenges I've just talked about. And so the lessee can elect to assume that a COVID-19 related rent concession is not a lease modification and therefore do one of the other accountings that I talked about. As I mentioned, in many cases that that might be the same. Now, this is only an exposure draft at the moment, so you can't use it yet. Hopefully it will be available for use by the end of May. Um, and as I said, it, it is lessees only, but nevertheless, it could be very helpful to lessees who can apply it. Thanks for that. Um, before we move on from, from talking about leases and, and, and onto the rest of our agenda, is there anything else that lessors and lessees should be thinking about at the moment? Thanks, Tony. And yes, there are a few other issues that have come out of COVID-19. So if we start with lessors, um, lessors are within the impairment requirements of IFRS 9. Um, so they do need to think about their expected credit loss. There is a separate IFRS talks and indeed our previous webcast touched on expected credit loss and payment holidays. So do either listen or watch that. If we flip over to lessees, um, obviously lessees are booked right of use assets. Those are subject to the normal impairment requirements, NICE 36. Um, so do remember that and think about impairment. Also, lessees might need to think about reassessing lease terms. So, for example, because of COVID-19, um, affected lessees may have taken a strategic step back and said, well, we had leases with extension options. And maybe previously we'd assume we would actually exercise some of those extension options. It was reasonably certain. In the light of the pandemic, they might think, well, let's do a strategic review of all our stores, for example, work out which ones we need, which ones we don't. And they might say, well, actually, it's no longer reasonably certain that we will exercise these termination options. Um, we, we're, we're actually going to close some stores and that might impact lease term. So that's another one to think about. And then the final one for lessees is about depreciating the right of use assets. Um, so we have had questions, can a lessee stop depreciating a right of use asset? For example, during the period a store is closed. Now that's no different to any other depreciation of PP&E. So this is a, a very good time for me to stop talking and pass over to the expert on this, which is Gary. Thanks very much for that, Sandra. That was that was really helpful. Um, I think, that, as, as you say, there's a there's a potential accounting consequence of, of assets becoming temporarily idle that goes beyond leases, which is the impact on depreciation. So, so Gary, what are the implications of depreciation and can an entity stop depreciating assets that are not being used during the pandemic? Thanks, Tony. Um, so as, as Sandra has mentioned, you know, many, many governments have, have imposed lockdown restrictions to, to minimise the spread of, of COVID-19. And this has unfortunately resulted in a number of assets becoming idle, um, not just right of use assets, but uh, shops, uh, offices, manufacturing sites, and in some cases, um, entire fleets of aircraft have been grounded. And so the question, as you as you mentioned, Tony, can an entity in, in cases uh, like this stop depreciating an asset if it's idle? I think the answer is that it depends, um, and it depends on your depreciation method. So if your depreciation method for a particular asset is straight line, then the answer would be no. You should not cease depreciating when the asset is idle, and that is pretty explicit in, in I-16, which is our, our standard on on PP&E and the equivalent standard IS38 on intangibles, if you have an intangible. However, if an asset is depreciated using a, a unit of production method, for example, then you don't stop depreciating, but your depreciation charge can be zero if there is no production in a particular period. So, you, as I said, it depends, and, and if you have a straight line, the answer would be no, you must carry on depreciating. If you have another method which is uh, akin to units of production, and you have no production or reduced production as a result of the lockdown, you may end up with a zero depreciation charge or a, or a minimal depreciation charge. Now, this generally then logically leads folks onto the, the follow up question, which is okay, then, so can I change my depreciation method to units of production during the period of, of lockdown? And I think again here it depends. Sorry to be a, a technical accountant, but it does really depend. But I think it's fair to say that it would be very unlikely. And, and let me maybe explain why that would be the case. 
that's because the principle um, for, for depreciation of, of PPE and intangibles is that an entity should um, select a method of depreciation that most closely reflects the pattern uh, of expected consumption of the future economic benefits embodied in that asset. So I know that's a mouthful, but it's really, it's really trying to say, you're trying to choose how you're going to reduce the future economic benefits that you have in that asset. How are they being used up? And, and, that, and the standard then goes on to say, you know, that depreciation method um, should be applied, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, should, sorry, should be reviewed at least each financial year. So you are actually required to review that each financial year. So there may be a change, you know, the standard envisages that. But at the same time, it also says, you know, that, that your depreciation method should be applied consistently from period to period, unless there is a significant change in the expected manner in which you're going to consume the economic benefits embodied in the asset. And so to get back to my original point of why I think it would be unlikely, you know, when an entity is using straight line depreciation method, that implicitly means the entity has done this type of assessment and determined that the economic benefits embodied in that asset are actually consumed as a result of the passage of time. And that gives you straight line because time moves in a straight line. Um, and that would mean that an entity, in order to, to change the depreciation method, would, would, be a, would have to demonstrate that that straight line or that the passage of time is no longer um, the correct input factor to determine the consumption of the economic benefits embodied in that asset. And as I say, we think that would be, that would be rare. Um, let, let me maybe use a, a couple of examples to, to demonstrate the points I'm trying to make here. So in the first example, you have uh, an airline a business that, that uh, as its policy, uh, management policy and strategy plans to replace its engines every five years, and it's identified the engines as a, as a separately identifiable component uh, under I-16. Now, because that entity has determined that they want to field the, the latest and greatest uh, fleet, and that requires replacement every five years. And as a result of that, the limiting factor or the, the, um, the, the fact that's going to determine the consumption of the economic benefits embodied in those engines is actually time, because regardless of the number of flight hours that have been incurred on those particular engines, management is intending to replace those engines, i.e. all the economic benefits will be consumed within that period of five years. Remember, uh, the, the, um, your useful life of an asset is not the same as its economic life. So the useful life in this case is five years, because that is the period over which management has determined they're going to extract all of the economic benefits embodied in that asset. Um, now, I think then in that case, straight line makes the most sense as a depreciation method because management is using time as the limiting factor that determines when the economic benefits will be consumed. And in that case, you know, you, you in theory, you may extend the useful life because of COVID-19. You might say, okay, we're going to wait five and a half years now before we replace the engines. But that's in that fact pattern, it, it wouldn't make sense to change from um, a time base to a production base because um, production is not the limiting factor, it is time. If you contrast that example with another airline, which uh, this is a different airline, they are more economical and they like to run their engines until all of the flight hours embodied in an engine have been completely used up. Now, that, 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 uh, in that example, uh, the, the airline may have been as a proxy for production of units or number of flight hours. They may have been using straight line because they generally use their engines on a consistent basis. However, in that case, as a result of COVID-19, if an airline that was um, utilizing or consuming the economic benefits embodied in those engines based on flight hours was not actually able to fly the, the, the aircraft and therefore utilize those flight hours, they might say, I'm required each year to reassess my depreciation method. And although I was using straight line, it was a proxy for flight hours. And that proxy is no longer relevant in the current economic environment. In that case, that entity may say, I'm changing my depreciation method or rather reflecting the more accurate depreciation method, which is a units of production, i.e. flight hours. And for an, in that type of example, you may actually find that you can reduce your depreciation or potentially have zero if the engines cannot be used at all during the financial period. And then maybe a third example, just to link back to the point Sandra is making, if we think of right of use assets specifically, in almost all cases, the limiting factor linked to a right of use asset is your lease term, which is determined by time. And so in, in most cases, we would expect that a right of use asset 
is accurately being depreciated a uh, straight line over time. And therefore, unfortunately, if you're not able to use that right of use asset as a result of lockdown, um, it would continue to be depreciated um, unless you know you, you modified the lease in some way, as, as Sandra mentioned before. So hopefully that gives folks a little bit more clarity on, on depreciation methods related to not just right of use assets, but PP and, and intangibles as well. Thanks for that, Gary. Now, the value at which assets and liabilities are carried on the balance sheet when they're measured at amortized cost is something that we talked about a lot uh, on our previous video and, and we, we talked about again during this discussion. Perhaps moving on from that a little bit, Sandra, what should we be thinking about when we look at financial assets that are measured at fair value? Yeah, thanks, Tony. That's another good question and one we've been having quite a lot. Um, let me start with the easiest case, which is level one or level two fair values. So these are fair values that are determined based on a quoted price in an active market, or alternatively using all significant observable inputs. Now here, I think the basic message is, well, fair value kind of is what it is. So if a fair value is based on, say, an observable market price, you just take the price as at the reporting date. The fact that prices might be volatile is not itself directly relevant, nor is the fact that prices might have fallen or recovered after the reporting date. Provided the market is still active, you just use the price as at the reporting date and similarly for observable inputs. That's probably the easiest case. When we move on to level three fair values, it can get more tricky. Um, now, given the uncertainties associated with COVID-19, actually estimating a level three fair value has become more subjective and judgmental. And this might be things like unquoted equities. You can clearly see the range of future profits that an entity might make has increased. It might include things like some failed own use contracts, for example, some streaming arrangements where, again, the output that's um, resulted in failed own use might be significantly less certain, or some long-term derivatives that are affected by the credit risk of the two parties. Now here, um, before COVID-19, in some cases, an entity would have had a cash flow projection, a single cash flow projection, and then discounted it at some kind of risk adjusted discount rate. Given all the uncertainties associated with COVID-19, that might no longer be an appropriate way to estimate fair value. Rather, the entity might need to forecast different possible scenarios, so multiple scenarios and probability weight them, and then, of course, discount each of those scenarios at a relevant rate. And the appropriate thing here is, apart from the judgment of determining what your scenarios are and how to weight them, is then to think about the impact on the discount rate. And the discount rate should match what you've done in the cash flows. So what I mean there is to the extent you have risk that we sometimes call diversifiable risk, and you've taken into account that risk in the cash flows, you shouldn't also build it into the discount rate because if you do, you'll double count. Conversely, if you haven't taken into account all that diversifiable risk in the cash flows, you should build it into the discount rate. And then the non-diversifiable risk, so the risk that, if you like, all valuations are affected by general economy type factors, that's nearly always taken into account in the discount rate by something called a beta, and that won't change. The other thing to think about is counterparty credit risk, which I mentioned in the context of derivatives, so it's not unique to derivatives. And often what companies did here was to build that into the discount rates. They'd add a, a credit spread to their discount rate to reflect that credit risk. And that spread may well have changed, particularly if the credit risk of the counterparties increased, then that will have be impacted, or indeed the credit risk of the entity in the case of a derivative with two-way cash flows. However, the risk-free component of the discount rate might actually have decreased. Um, many governments have, have made measures to decrease their, their base rates, their, their benchmark rates in the light of COVID-19. So think about the discount rate, you can have effects go in different directions. And then the final thing I want to cover as ever is disclosure. Don't forget disclosures. And I should say here, including in interims, quite unusually, a lot of the disclosures that are required in year end under IFRS 13 are also required in interims. So a few things to focus on here. Um, valuation techniques and in particular how they've changed. So if you have gone from a single cash flow estimate to multiple cash flow estimates, that will be something to disclose. Um, transfers between levels in the fair value hierarchy. 
we're not seeing much of that, but if you have gone from level one to level two or level two to level three, um, then that would require disclosure. For level three fair values, the sensitivities of that fair value estimate to reasonable alternative possible assumptions, um, that, um, that variability, that sensitivity may well have got greater. So in cases where you might not judge that was a material disclosure in the past, it might be now. And then finally, particularly in interims, IS34 has a very specific requirement that if there are changes in business or economic circumstances that affect the fair values of financial assets or financial liabilities, then that has to be disclosed. And the important thing there is that is not restricted to assets measured at fair value. So even for financial assets measured at cost, you need to think about that disclosure. Thanks for that, Sandra. Now, Gary, um, our last discussion addressed some of the key valuation issues for non-financial assets measured at something other than fair value. We talked particularly about the pros and cons of adjusting for the increased risk as a result of COVID-19 and the discount rate or in the expected cash flows. You also talked about how an entity might consider subsequent events and whether they are adjusting or non-adjusting when estimating the recoverable amount of PP&E and intangibles. Are there any new messages or new developments that you want to share related to the valuation of non-financial assets that are not measured at fair value? Thanks, Tony. Yeah, there's, there's maybe one new message that's uh, worth sharing with folks, uh, and that relates to the impairment testing under IS36. And specifically, when you're doing impairment testing of, of CGUs or cash generating units that include goodwill. Now, as a consequence of COVID-19, you know, entities might have impairment indicators at their cash generating units or CGUs. And, and let's just remind folks, remember that a, a CGU is the, the smallest group of assets that generate cash inflows that are largely independent from each other. So they're kind of a self-sustaining um, generating unit, a cash generating unit. So these CGUs, if there's an impairment indicator, are tested for impairments under IS36, the same standard that, that tells us to do impairment testing of goodwill. Now, if these CGUs include good, goodwill, or they might be part of a larger group of CGUs that include goodwill, because in a lot of cases, folks test goodwill at a segment level. And as a result, that normally a segment is made up of a number of, of CGUs. And the question that, is, that has arisen is, at what level an entity first tests for impairment? So does the entity first test the goodwill as they are required to do every year when there's an indicator of impairment of goodwill? And then after testing the goodwill, which includes those CGUs, you then test the underlying CGU at which there was an impairment indicator? Or do you first test the CGUs and then you test the related goodwill? So do you go top down or do you go bottom up? And, and the answer is, is obviously on the slide. Um, IS36 requires a, a bottom up approach. And so maybe if I can just rephrase that in almost like a two-step process. So step one is you will test the individual, if there's an indicator of impairment, you'll test the individual asset or in most cases, the related CGU. And if there is an impairment, an impairment would be recognized and reduce the carrying amount of that CGU to its recoverable amount. Then you go to step two. Now you test that CGU or a group of CGUs that include the related goodwill. So you do this second impairment test. And this second stage is a comparison of the recoverable amount with the restated carrying amount after you did the step one impairment. So it's a two-step process and you start at the bottom and then you test after you may have uh, booked any impairment at the lower level. Now, now given the potential impacts of COVID-19 on an entity's cash flows, what this means is that the cash flows in the current economic environment must first be sufficient to support the carrying amount at the CGU level, excluding goodwill, before the test is done at a group of CGUs or the operating segment that includes goodwill. Now, as most companies normally test goodwill at a higher, a higher level, as I mentioned, that, than, than a single CGU, that means you're going to need to effectively do a second test to confirm that the cash flows are sufficient to cover both the individual CGU as well as the group of CGUs that includes goodwill. And so I guess that's maybe the key takeaway or my first key takeaway from this, this point, which is um, you're probably going to have to do two impairment tests to the extent that there was an impairment indicator at a CGU. And the second one is, as we've got on the slide, remember that it's a bottom up impairment test. Maybe then one point uh, worth mentioning as well, one very important point is due to the different levels of impairment testing that, that I've just described that are required, 
it's equally, if not more important, that the CGUs are correctly identified. Because if you get the CGUs wrong, um, you might end up masking um, or uh, an impairment by incorporating cash flows and assets into CGUs that should actually have been te tested separately. And this is important because in most cases, we have to test goodwill, well, in all cases, we have to test goodwill for impairments annually, but you don't necessarily have to test your underlying CGUs. And so management may not have had to identify or test individual CGUs for a very long time or necessarily ever, ever. And so, you know, I think that the, my third and final takeaway here is, to the extent you haven't had to do this in the past, start thinking about how you identify your CGUs now to the extent that it's not immediately clear. And this is especially true if you are in a vertically integrated business where it's not immediately apparent um, what, your, what your cash generating units would be if there have been impairment indicators at the CGU level. Okay, thanks for that, Gary. And that gets us through the, the items that we've specifically included on the agenda for this video. But perhaps we can now spend a few minutes talking about some of the questions we've received. And I thought I'd start with Sandra. You mentioned when you were talking about leases that the ISB has proposed some changes to IFRS 16. Can you tell us a little bit more about those proposals? Yeah, sure, Tony. Um, so the first thing to say is they are proposed amendments. They would be lessees only and they would relate to COVID-19 related rent concessions. And as you might expect, that's not a completely free choice. There are some proposed conditions that would need to be met to be a COVID-19 related rent concession. And there are three. The first is that consideration for the lease is either substantially the same or less. The second is that the concession relates to payments that were originally due in 2020. And the third is that there are no other substantive change to the conditions of the lease. Now for those, the lessees um, would have an optional exemption to not account for them as lease modifications. That doesn't mean they've got no work to do because having figured out it's not a lease modification, you still have to figure out what it is and it could be one of the other options I've talked about. Um, but as I said, when I talked about this a few minutes ago, in some instances, the, the actual county may come out about the same or indeed the same. The next thing to note is this is not an entity-wide all or nothing choice, but nor is it a lease by lease choice. So it's proposed that this will be applied by lessees to lease contracts with similar characteristics, which is just like the rest of IFRS 16. And then the final thing is timing. As I mentioned, it is a proposal, it's an exposure draft, but the ISB has very heavily fast-tracked this. Um, they had a 14-day comment period, that has now ended. They are debating the comments um, on Friday the 15th, so that may be for or after you listen to this webcast, looking to finalise it by the end of May and available immediately. So it would be mandatory for periods after the 1st of June, but it could be applied retrospectively. And what that means is if you have a reporting date of, say, 31st of March, either an interim date or a year-end date, and you haven't yet authorised those 31 March financial statements for issue, then you can apply this relief. If those financial statements have already been issued, then clearly you can't. But when you do your next set of financial statements, you can apply this retrospectively and, and restate the relevant comparative period. Okay, <laughs> which was very useful. And one of the things that you mentioned specifically is that there is no relief for lessors. Where does that leave lessors? Um, that's an also a very good question, which we've been having. Um, so two things. The first is I mentioned it's an exposure draft. Um, I understand the ISB had nearly 100 comment letters, and I would expect a fair few of those said, can lessors please have the same relief because they face similar operational challenges. Um, so I can't sit here today. I don't have a crystal ball and say whether lessors will or will not be granted the relief, but do watch this space and, and do just check where the ISB finally lands. The second thing is if lessors don't get the relief, um, then remember the two page document I mentioned and all the stuff I talked about earlier on still applies. Um, so it's still not necessarily the case that a, a rent concession is a modification. Um, and it might be the case that the accounting is broadly the same, no matter which way a lessor lands. We do have a separate FAQ specific to lessors. Um, one thing I'll specifically note, a lot of these leases are operating leases for the lessor, 
And in that case, if the concession relates to future rents that haven't yet been charged and not yet are receivable in the books, then often lessors simply spread in an operating lease all future rents straight line, and therefore the impact will be just be spread straight line over the remaining lease term. As you saw, there were a number of ifs in that, so don't leap to that conclusion. That might well end up being the case. Okay, so thanks very much for that, Sandra. And now I'll, I'll, I'll push a few questions at Gary. And the, the, the first one that we've received is, is in connection with what you talked about around impairment. And you talked about doing a bottom-up approach, uh, doing a two-step approach. Are there any circumstances other than goodwill where you might have to think about that type of approach? Yeah, Tony, thanks. That's actually a great question because um, there probably is another scenario, at least one other, where you might need to think about doing that. And that is uh, to the extent that you have what we call corporate assets. And folks, again, may recall corporate assets are assets which support the business but don't generate cash inflows largely independently of other assets and they don't fit neatly into any individual cash generating units. So, for example, your head office uh, your head office uh, building, for example, or an R&D function that, uh, that isn't a CGU. And I think what the standard says in that case is to the extent that you can do a reasonable allocation of those corporate assets to the underlying CGUs, which have been identified for an impairment test, you do an, an allocation of the, of the corporate assets. However, if you can't allocate those corporate assets on a reasonable basis, which is often the case, then you effectively need to do the same bottom-up test um, with those corporate assets in the same way you would do Goodwill. So you would first test the underlying CGU, as we mentioned before, at the bottom, and test if there's an impairment there. And following any impairments that you may have recorded there, you then group enough CGUs together that incorporate the corporate asset and do a second impairment test, uh, testing the corporate asset for impairments at the higher level, similar to the way you would test Goodwill. So a good question. So it's it's broader than just Goodwill. Okay. So thanks for that. Now I'll, uh, I'll change direction again completely. And, and, and we've got a couple of questions that relate to the things you talked about on our previous video um, around government assistance. And we've had one question in particular, which asks how an entity goes about determining whether it is actually the beneficiary of a grant, whether it's actually received the grant and therefore has to apply the accounting in IS 20. So perhaps you could think about that a little bit. Sure, Tony. Yeah. And I mean, we folks may recall on the, on the earlier webcast you mentioned, we, we do talk about the challenge that in, in some cases um, uh, it might be difficult to determine if the intermediary is actually the party that receives the grant or whether or not the intermediary is, is merely an agent that acts as a conduit for passing the grant over to the to the beneficiary. And this is important because if the intermediary is the party that receives the grant, they will apply IS-20, our accounting standard on government grants, to whatever portion of that arrangement relates to the government assistance. Whereas if they're merely an agent or a conduit, they would not apply IS-20 to the government uh, grant portion of that, of that transaction. And in our earlier webcast, we actually thought, we mentioned that we thought the principles in IFRS 15, uh, standard on revenue recognition, uh, made sense to apply. And folks uh, may be thinking, why on earth would, uh, would a standard on revenue recognition help in determining whether or not you're the recipient of the government grant? And I think the important aspect there is that we were really focusing on control. And I think we do still believe that control is the most appropriate concept to apply in determining whether or not the, the intermediary is the recipient of the grant, because control goes back to the framework and control is our, is our building blocks for whether or not you actually have an asset. However, uh, just to clarify, we, we don't think that the, the factors in IFRS 15 on agent first principle are necessarily written um, to make the control determination for these types of arrangements. And so, you know, we've concluded that the factors in IFRS 15 are probably not where someone would naturally go looking and making this judgment of control, but we do believe control is still the right, the right principle to apply. And maybe some factors that folks may want to think about when, when applying this control principle with respect to determining whether or not you're the recipient of the government grant uh, might include kind of the, the who, how, and when, I'll call it. So as an example, you know, whether the intermediate has discretion uh, to determine which end parties receive the relief. So for ex an example, if an employer has discretion over which employees receive a relief package, that might indicate that the employer controls the grant before it transfers to the selected employees. So the employer has the ability to decide who gets the grant. 
Um, uh, you may also have situations where an intermediary has discretion over how much of the relief it must distribute and the manner in which it must, it must make the distribution. So for example, if a lessor can determine how much of a, release, a relief package it needs to pass on to their C's, or whether or not that relief, as Sandra said before, will take the form of a payment holiday or a payment a deferral or reduced rental, uh, this might indicate that the lessor controls the relief before it transfers to the lessee because the lessor is controlling how that relief will be transferred. And then getting on to the when, if the intermediary has discretion over the timing of when it distributes the relief. Um, so for example, uh, if a lessee can demand that the lessor passes over the uh, relief that was provided by the government, this might indicate that the lessor doesn't control the grant before because um, it can't uh, uh, control the, the timing of when that grant is passed on, so the when. And maybe another linked example, um, if you had an intermediary um, that initiates the, the application for the relief, or whether or not it's actually the end party that initiates the application for the relief. So we've seen some of these in, the, in financial services when uh, a borrower applies through the intermediary bank for a government subsidized loan. Um, uh, this might indicate that the bank doesn't control the grant before it transfers if it's actually the, the borrower who determines the timing because they do the application and the intermediary is really just acting as a facilitator. So again, those are just indicators, but again, the point is that the underlying principle, I think, continues to be control in trying to make this determination of whether or not you've received a government grant. Thanks very much, Gary, uh, and thanks very much, Sandra. I think that's pretty much all we have time for, but before we wrap up, I thought I'd just summarize the key messages that have come out of this discussion and out of our discussion on the previous video. I think I said before that the impact of COVID-19 is pervasive and the situation is evolving rapidly. The most significant impact of the virus from an accounting perspective is the uncertainty it creates. And that in turn creates a need for more judgment and maybe some changes to the measurement methods and techniques you've used previously. Don't assume that something that worked at the last reporting date is going to work again now. It's important to allow time in the reporting timetable to focus on the issues caused by the pandemic. Make sure the issues are addressed early and allow time to work through them and avoid surprises. And finally, good disclosure remains imperative. We hope that this video will help you as you navigate some key issues. And if you would like to find out more, our in-depth publication, which discusses the accounting implications of the effects of the coronavirus and is linked to the FAQs that Gary and Sandra talked about, is available on inform.pwc.com. Thank you.